Quick little emergency video on the Tour de France 2020. This was one of the most unbelievable stages I've ever seen in my life. Um, unbelievable in terms of performance, but also the drama. Um, so Tali Bigach was 57 seconds back um, on the general classification going into the stage. Primoz Roglic, favourite, everyone thought he was going to do it. I had a sneaking suspicion, but I couldn't believe it. I was like, Roglic has been bad in time trials, but I think he's over it. And I said that to my mates. I said, you know, I think he's over it. He'll do well. Um, Pogaccio could win the stage, but you, know, I, you might put 20 seconds into it. But I doubt any more than that. And then, obviously, that was just crazy. Pogaccio was like, from minute one, was ahead of him. And it was an unbelievable performance. We're going to get into the details of the time trial in a minute. I just want to go through the GC and uh, other people's rides. So you can see that Pogaccio had a pretty good ride, you know, an unbelievable ride. He beat Tom de Moulin and Richie Port by a minute and 21. Wout Van Aert by a minute 30. And Roglic by two minutes, which is unbelievable. But I think the biggest tell on this day was that to Tom de Moulin and Richie Port only beat like Rami Cavagna by 30 seconds. So I think Pogaccio had an unreal ride, but Roglic also choked slightly. This means Pogaccio won GC. Youth, K1. I don't know if this has ever been done. I think he's the second youngest Tour de France winner ever. Um, some bloke won in 1903, but birth certificates then, no one knows. So I'm basically calling him youngest winner ever. But we'll go over to the individual time trial now. So the the time is what we just saw on the previous page. Pro Cycling Stats have a really good breakdown. Um, so this was like, obviously, you know, the same times. But these are the different time checks. So we have one halfway down, one just at the base of the Ponce Buffy at one halfway up. Uh, so first time check, pan flat, as you can see, you know, pretty much. Uh, Kivania is up. He's up. On Pagaccio by like what 30 seconds, 20 seconds, so nothing, nothing too crazy. Um 20, 27 seconds that would be. Um so you know, you know, no, so 17 seconds. I can't do math, sorry about that. I'm too excited. And you know, Pagach is already up 13 seconds on Roglic. And on a flat 14 kilometer, I wouldn't I was like, that's bad news for Roglic, but maybe it's just pacing themselves. We saw this by Van Aert. Van Aert was very far down. And then rode a really strong last climb. So I thought Yama Visma, that I assume they'd have the same modeling system for Van Art and Roglic, and they would have said these are the numbers you need to do. So I wasn't I wasn't too panicked, right? Then the time gaps, they had the live time gaps on the on the TV and it kept going out. And this is at the base of so you know completely flat. De Moulin ahead by one second on Pagaccio. So more or less the same. It was a lumpy, but I'd say an, a typical um Grand Tour time trial up to 30 kilometers to go. You know, not pan flat, not a Julie, you know, like we have in the UK, we have a 10 mile TT, it was roundabout back. You know, it was like a, a rolling course, you know, nothing crazy. But Bagatia was already up on Roglic by 40 seconds. And that, I think, is alarm bells ringing. Because Bagatia Roglic, on that sort of a terrain, you'd expect them to be, you know, right on pole, maybe 10, 15 seconds if one of them was having an exceptional day and one of them has like, a bad day. But that 40 second gap, I think, already shows you that they're not. Ha like Pogacar's having an unreal day, no doubt about it. That's based on the fact that he beat everyone by a minute, or over a minute. But I think Roglic, this also shows that he was having a bad day because he's already further down on the flat than you'd expect. But then I still thought it could be recoverable on the climb. But then you can already see on the 33.6 kilometers, you already know that he was struggling big time because halfway up the climb, and that's when he lost it. That's when the tour was gone. It said on the GPS and he'd lost it. And that's when I was going absolutely mental. You know, on this point, mile, he's now a minute and 15 back, 20 seconds um, down in the virtual general classification, halfway up the climb. And the climb, OK, it's rampy, but, you know, more or less it's 11 percent average. So it was an unreal performance from Pagaccio from day one, uh, from like the start. And he just held it. And Brad Wiggins was chatting, chatting rubbish about how, you know, or maybe, you know, Pagaccio's going out too hard. Now, nah, Pagaccio had it, had the numbers executed perfectly and I can't wait to see um, what the power is. I doubt he's going to upload it, but we'll be able to see the climbing time. So we can already see the climbing time here. Pagaccio was 22 seconds ahead of Richie Port, which I think shows that Port had an unreal climbing day again and that Pagaccio was just better on the day, but not crazy amounts, which is why, again, I think Roglic, he doesn't even reach the top 10. And that shows you that he was seriously off because in the tour, Pagaccio, Port, Roglic, all similar time. Enrique Mass again, Super solid time. Carapaz quite disappointing, really, compared to Roglic. But Carapaz could have done anything on that day. He wouldn't have beaten Pagacha. Pagacha was flying. But now we're going to get in, into the watts per kilo of the climb and what it looks like. So obviously, this is La Ponche de Belfi. Uh, this is the climb here today. Uh, the segment, unfortunately, is a little bit lower. If we get, look at the finish, um, obviously, there's a lot of roads. But what actually happens is they sort of go around and up towards the finish. So they miss the last little kick. So I'd say maybe add, I think... 
when Bade set this time, this was when Aru set the fastest time, which I think maybe at a minute, maybe that's that's what I'd say, but maybe 30 seconds. So something like that. Um, we can we can see on, on one of these tweets that I have um, I've saved a lot of tweets for you. Um, yeah, so 16 minutes 12. So yeah, about a minute. Um, so if we look at today's fastest times, it doesn't give you too much. Um, Warren Bargi did 16.03. So then obviously we can see Warren Bargi did 17.27. So maybe a minute and 15 seconds, because obviously in a road stage, the last part's always done at higher higher wattage. Um, so we can see Leonard Kamner here's 400 watts at 66 kilos. That's about 5.6 watts per kilo, 5.7, and finishes 16 minutes 12, so over a minute back um, to Pogaccia. So now you sort of know the level that Pogaccia's at. Now we're going to go through some tweets, and you can see here what people expected. The GC guys are doing a 55 minutes an hour effort, so they won't be able to beat that. Wrong. They will. And Pogaccia wasn't, and Carapaz wasn't the quickest, Pogaccia was. So Ufe, okay, he does like a bit of doping conspiracy theories. I'm going to not talk too much about that. Um, obviously go on Twitter and you'll find everything. I don't think I can add anything that anyone else has just posted. And obviously you can throw dirt at any team. It's up to you if you want to believe it or not. That's up to you and make your own decisions. Um, I, I used to do that more, but I think there's no point in doing that. So Wiggins did 6.7 on the climb. Bardet did 6.6 .6 and they beat them both. And they were drafting. So now you know that's not six and a half. Like he also had a bike change. So he was flying. I think could be seven could be close to seven on his own. Obviously, tailwinds, headwinds, all the rest of them. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's unbelievable. This is the climbing time. Again, you can see here, uh, it, it, it's just crazy. Um, so you can see Leonard Kemner was a minute 30 back and did 400 watts and weighs, you know, I think nominally on Strava, similar weight, 66 kilos is what, is what their boy says here. And so, you know, He's doing a lot more watts. Obviously, power meters read differently. Kemen, as I said in a previous video, has a, has a um, Shimano, which the right-hand side generally reads lower. Um, but still, unbelievable. Uh, when we really think about it, um, he's doing six, sorry, six watts per kilo. And he beat him by a minute. So it's, it's close to seven for sure. And I mean, I think you could pretty confidently say he's done seven watts per kilo for the last 15 minutes. Other people may disagree. Uh, we can get in some computer modeling, but I, I don't think there's a necessarily huge point because it doesn't really show much because you don't know all the variables that Pogaccia has. We look at the wind. It was decent, 10 kilometers an hour easterly. So obviously that's a slight taily, like east obviously is this way. Um, but, you know, it's steep. I don't think that's, it's not like you had a 40 kilometers an hour tailwind. So obviously that helps. I don't know what the other... Um, situations were in the previous climbs like Aru, but obviously they were all drafting. So yeah, again, I think I think, and I'm pr very confident to say that you would have climbed at around 6.8 to 7 watts per kilo, which some people say is the magic number. I'm not going to speculate any more on that. But unbelievable performance by Teddy Pogaccia, and you know one of the best rides and best drama in terms of Tour de France. It was boring. And anyone who tells you it wasn't boring, it was boring until stage 20. But stage 20, my God, it was exciting. And I, yeah, I've, you know, it was really, really crazy how, um, how good that was, the, the, the stage. Um, and yeah, really, it's super, super good. I still think potentially Kenner's powers a little bit. I think it, it, you know, it could be six and a half what he did. But because I look at uh, Bookman, he did, that's 360 is normally six watts per kilo. But anyway, I think, you know, and it's safe to say it was well above six and a half, potentially seven, but somewhere in that ballpark, which, you know, go on your power meter and ride it seven watts per kilo. I reckon you could do it for three minutes, you know, three, four minutes for an average person, maybe not an average, but like a good person. I mean, he's doing it, you know, close to seven, maybe for 15 minutes. At the end of the tour, after an hour, it's ridiculous, man. It's, it's unbelievable. This is the tweet I want to end it. I think Neil Rogers... It's an interesting tweet. Um, you know, he says to anyone stunned or disbelieved, raising eyebrows, that's fair. It's pro cycling. Spores a long and dubious history. Pogacar's TT ride, the winning margin, defies logic. It doesn't mean it was legitimate, but well, all within our rights to pose questions. I think that's a good way to end this video. Um, obviously, leave your thoughts below. What do you think about Pogacar's ride? Did Roglic choke? In my opinion, Roglic's biggest bottle job in history in time trials. Messed up Giro, messed up Tour last year, messed up two years ago, messed up Tour this year. Bottle job. 
Um, I, I don't not I, I I'm, a, I'm not afraid to say it. I don't really like his style. It's very boring. He attacks on the last kilometer. Um, he, I've never seen him do anything exciting in his life, and he is a robot. So I'm not a huge Roglic fan. I don't hate him. I, I just don't really find any connection with him personally. Uh, Tadej Pogacar, legend of the sport. He just seems a cool lad. See him around town. What a boy. He's not even that lean. Look at his calves. He could lose like a kilo with his calves. I reckon. Like he has a lot to go. That man. Um, so it's very exciting to see what he's going to do. And obviously we've got Bernal, we've got Pidcock, we've got Remco, we've got everyone. Tour de France in the next couple of years is going to have some top, top talents. Um, so I'm very excited to commentate on that. Um, and cheers for watching. And we will see you in the next video.